Dear friends, um, please welcome uh, to this um, webinar series uh, on bridging societal divides through healing. And we have an incredible number of, I think, 109 registrants. So we are so proud and happy that you have joined. I'm calling, uh, my name is Santi Pendikan, and I'm calling from the Nakosta Naya land. Uh, Liz Medicine Crow, please correct if I did not pronounce that appropriately, but uh, this is in Arlington. Virginia, I'm heading a center here that is looking globally into uh, how to make truth and reconciliation processes more impactful. And um, we're just so honored of, of having this chance to have this conversation with you. Uh, President Biden has spoken over um, past months about the need for national healing. And yesterday when he addressed the, the challenges of the national equity, uh, the racial equity, he said that the soul of the nation will remain troubled until systemic racism is dismantled, illustrating how, how the uh, topic of healing is very wide, where gaining agency and having the power is significant of achieving healing. But I'm not the only one, I'm sure, that who has lost at times sleep wondering uh, how can healing be possible in this nation that is so divided. And, but I have be, become to realize that actually this country has everything that it takes to succeed in this process. And that comes through the incredible leadership that has over a year worked on its topic and vast advanced this in local level. And I'm just so proud of having this chance to introduce the speakers uh, today. Um, I've been so amazed of Dr. Christopher, Gail Christopher, your work, and I so much look forward to this next phase uh, when this process is moving into a national level, how you will be providing leadership on this issue. Our, our second speaker, Liz Medicine Crow, is a living illustration how the leadership has been put in place in Alaska, where she has led this effort uh, for multiple years. Um, then we also have uh, Tim Phillips with us in a call who has had this calling for centuries already, how you connect this experience overseas to the processes in this country. And then of course, my dear friend Sabra Williams, who is a living testament to this work and will help us lead through. And finally, my dear colleague Colette Rout has prepared this event. It has been a true honor, Colette, to work with you. So we hope that um, you will remain, uh, those of you who have some ideas uh, how to continue this this uh, webinar series with us that there'll be a Zoom link shared later on the call that you will have a chance to stay with us and provide your ideas and recommendations because we want this to be a space where your expertise, your knowledge becomes known uh, and shared. Um, so I hand it over to you, Colette. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Auntie. And welcome everybody. Um, it's such an honor today to moderate this event. And I'd like to start out uh, with just a few logistical points. One is that the chat is open. So if you get inspired throughout the discussion with a question or a thought, just pop it over into the chat. We're not gonna use the raise hand feature. Um, so just feel free to, as you're thinking and things are flowing to just send it over to the chat. And after the discussion, we'll go through a question and answer period. And the second is this discussion is being recorded. So it will be available on the Mary Hoke Center for Reconciliation website, as well as shared on any of the speakers or other websites. Please feel free to share it um, as soon as the link is ready. And then third, stay all the way through because there's a special treat for everybody. We're gonna have a creative exercise that, invo that, involves, um, that involves poetry. So please, um, if you have a pen and paper handy, or if you want to use your computer, because you'll be doing it in the chat or on paper, then in the chat, you might want to grab that, um, grab that now. So before we kick off the session, I want to just take a moment to invite everyone to arrive in our vir virtual living room or conference room or however we want to phrase it. And I would just invite everybody to take a moment just to notice where you're sitting, or if by chance you're just hanging out and laying back and listening, however you are, wherever you are, um, just to kind of notice where, where you're sitting and maybe feel your body in that, in that space. And then I would just invite you, if you would like to, to take a minute after you kind of get settled and kind of 
get comfortable, to take a walk with your eyes, to look beyond your computer screen or your phone screen or iPad or whatever device you have, look beyond that. And maybe just kind of take a look around the room that you're in or the space, or maybe you're outside. Um, maybe it's warm in some of the places where, where some of you might be. And if you have a window, maybe just kind of gaze out the window and as far as you can see. And just kind of be curious wherever your eye is and what catches it. And then just maybe notice if you do, like I noticed when I started to look beyond my computer screen, I actually breathed, took a breath. <laughs> my shoulders relaxed a minute. Um, and then after that, you know, when you feel like it, just maybe walk back your eyes and kind of get settled back in your chair again. And if you'd like to, or you feel moved to do it, maybe if you want to kind of move your head, if you want to move the head, kind of feel the stretching because we get so fixated on our screen. Maybe just a little move, however you want to move it. If your shoulders want to get into the action, whatever they want to do, one want to move up and down, however yours want to move. If they want to move, they don't have to move. Whatever your arms want to do, if they want to, they don't have to. Okay, and then just invite you to kind of come back to your space where you're sitting, get comfortable. Okay, so welcome again. And um, the next thing is we're gonna start our discussion. And our discussion today, as Auntie had mentioned, is gonna explore questions such as how do we heal as a country, as a society? What does it mean to heal and how does healing occur? What are the challenges to bridging divides between individuals or communities? And what are the opportunities for bridging those divides? And Auntie provided a brief overview of each of our panelists. And I'd invite you to, if you'd like a more detailed um, background of our amazing panelists and all, that they're, all the work that they're doing, there will be a link um, dropped in the chat that will have more details. And I just wanna briefly touch upon some of their work. Uh, Dr. Gail Christopher is an award-winning social change agent who currently serves as the executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity and is a co-chair of the United States Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Movement. Liz Laganai, Medicine Crow, is an enrolled tribal citizen of the organized village of Cake. And her role is president and CEO of the first Alaskan Institute and co-chair for the United States Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Movement. She integrates native knowledge and values into organizations, governance mechanisms and everyday life. Tim Phillips is a founder and CEO of Beyond Conflict. Through his extensive international peace building experiences, he has used a unique approach of shared experience, which relies on the ability of people to learn from one another and their capacity to change. Sabra Williams is co-founder of Creative Acts, a social justice initiative that uses the arts as a tool for transformation. In addition to many other roles, she has received international acclaim for her work as an actor, host, and co-founder of the Actor Gang Prison Project. And Auntie Pentikiainen is the founding director of the Mary Hoke Center for Reconciliation and secretary of the United States Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Movement. He has over 20 years of international peace building experience and is currently focusing on understanding the roles of inner insider reconcilers and connecting community level efforts with state level political processes. 
And as Auntie mentioned, I'm Colette Rausch, and I am a senior research affiliate with the Mary Hoke Center for um, Reconciliation. So let's get started. It is my honor to turn it over to Dr. Gail Christopher. And Dr. Christopher is going to lead us off with her remarks and she's going to provide the foundation for the rest of our discussion. Dr. Christopher. Thank you, Colette, and thank you, Auntie. And it's my honor and privilege to be on this panel with all of these esteemed leaders, people whose hearts are embedded in this work and who believe in it and have hope for a better future for our country. Uh, let me start by answering the question, you know, how do we heal? Uh, I like to think of it as um, a returning to our wholeness, an acknowledgement of our wholeness and our interconnectedness as a human family, as a global human family, as well as our connection to nature and to all that there is ultimately. And so these divisions that we create, be they political or religious and most uh, prominently in this country, racial, they're really a, a, a projection of deeply held ideas, ideas which are in some cases grounded in myth. The idea of racism and racial hierarchy is grounded in a myth, really, uh, that dates back to the 1700s and before, uh, a false taxonomy, a, a false ideology of a hierarchy of the human family that's, that's based on physical characteristics or perceptions. And so I think when we heal, we usually change our minds and we change our hearts. Now, how do we heal? How do we uh, find ourselves stimulated or motivated to, to grow, to develop, to relinquish um, limiting ideas and beliefs? Now there's the rub, there's the question. And there are many avenues to that uh, I, I love Sabra's work in the arts. The arts can be so transformative. Um, meaningful relationships that defy our preconceived notions about uh, people, they can lead to transformation as well. Uh, I've come to, over the years, to believe that there are some prerequisites, some skills that we can develop that enhance our capacities to not fall into the traps of these false ideas and these false uh, projections, if you will, onto others of these great divides. And, and those skills, they're really heart skills. When I say heart skills, they, they come from, um, from a place of empathy and compassion and grace. And so I really believe the work of, of healing America is coupled with the work of developing those capacities and skills and inviting people into experiences where those kinds of emotions really and thoughts and feelings where those kinds of emotions and ultimately that kind of energy fills the space and people in the as a result of being immersed in those kinds of um, spaces they, they have room for growth and development and they are motivated to let go of those things that keep us apart. So that's kind of a almost you know, poetic way of saying it. Now, now I'll put on my strategy hat, which I've had to wear over the last you know, 40 years. And um, we have developed an approach to this work that we call truth, racial healing and transformation and it really does embody those undergirding understandings, which by the way are grounded in, in, in evidence, in neuroscience, you know, in the biophysiology of the human body. But we are definitely advocating for a more honest and, and expansive narrative of who we are as a people, a more, um, more robust application of, of efforts, of concerted efforts to bring people together and, and lift up our common humanity. And then of course the transformation, the, the, the changing of the structures and the systems of oppression and inequity. I'll close by saying that, you know, other things that President Biden has said, he reminded us that sometimes enough of us get it right to pull the rest of us along and in, in this time of great division and great extremes, I think our challenge is to expand the middle, 
you know, to create a critical mass of public will and public sentiment for moving forward. And the more of us that, that come on board with that, the greater likelihood for us to truly transform our country. So I'll stop there, but I, I am eagerly awaiting hearing what my colleagues have to say. Thanks so much for um, laying the groundwork and, and groundwork and putting things into a context um, for us to build upon Dr. Christopher. Thanks so much. So uh, Liz Medicine Crow, can you talk a little bit and introduce some of your work and how that connects to healing? Yeah. Uh, um, good morning. Well, I guess it's now afternoon. So, um, which is in my Tlingit language, good, um, good day. Um, it's a real honor to be here to spend time talking about something that is so critical to the advancement of uh, all the people who now call this country their home. And, you know, I'm coming to you from my homeland, Tlingit Ani. Uh, Thlingit lands uh, here in Southeast Alaska. I am Raven Kach Adi. Uh, Kach Adi is the fresh watermark sockeye salmon, which is our crest on my uh, Thlingit side. And on my Haida side, I am an eagle uh, Chichkitne woman and our crest is the hummingbird. Um, and my family on my Haida side comes from Haida Gwaii um, down in British Columbia, what's now known as, or currently known as British Columbia, um, and Heidelberg, and then my grandmother moved here to Cape when she married my grandfather. I guess the best way for me to respond to that question is to say, what else is there besides healing? Aren't we all on a journey to make things better for our people, for our families? This framework of healing is not something that's new or you know, a, a construct of our time. This is something that for my ancestors and for all of your ancestors, they were already engaged in. And our job of the living generations now, I feel, is to figure out how to apply that, um, how to operationalize it within the sickness that is plaguing us today. And that sickness is, as Gail described, this belief in the hierarchy of human value. And so when I think about healing, I think about how I see our people engaging in that space for thousands of years and applying the things that have been given to us to take care of and steward. Yes, our oceans, our waters, our lands. Yes, our animals and our relatives um, that make up this world that we are in. Um, but also for one another and for our community collective as a whole. And I think that that's something that excites me about the truth, racial healing and transformation endeavor. When we think about what healing means, it means to be human mm -hmm. together and to apply that force um, internally to each of us personally and within our communities, right? That societal well-being that we we know we are distant from, but we, we still have so many pockets of that strength um, and institutionally and systemically. So I'm really excited to be able to be on this journey to look back um, into our, our ancestral knowledge of the things that keep us well, you know, despite all the hardships that colonization has um, pushed down upon my people, our native peoples, we still have our ancestor ceremonies that brilliance is still here. And it is what keeps us strong. All of our people have those mechanisms. So how can we operationalize that in our strategy to heal this country and its brokenness? Uh, so I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Liz. Um, Liz, how about you? healing permeates, as you mentioned, so many things and, and how we can expand our, our vision of what healing can, can undertake and what it means for broken society. Um, I would like to now ask Tim if he could talk a little bit 
about his work and its connection to healing. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and and I'm really deeply um, privileged following Gail and Liz and what they had to say. And um, so, as an American who spent the last 30 years going out in the world, um, I realize when I look back, it was to also heal what I experienced as an American uh, through the experience of others around the world. And you know, now 30 years later, our own country is in a crisis. I quite never imagined we would be in at this level. And so I look to this sort of shared experience of these individuals around the world who had a struggle um, to heal. And what was what was the process of healing like for the ones I, I came to know? And, and when I reflect on this moment in this country, I think healing requires a degree of clarity. And that clarity is a clarity about oneself, about uh, the situation that led them into the conflict or the crisis they're in. And through that clarity comes an understanding. And I think in that understanding, um, you know, you, you, you get to a point where you really understand as an individual, what is happening, what is at the core of your struggle, what is at the core of your crisis, what is at the core of your trauma. And that requires, by definition, being centered. And when I think of what Liz and Gail said about this nation, it's being centered in ourselves in terms of healing, but it's centered as a nation and, and understanding what is actually happening. And when we hear conversations about unity, it strikes me that it's really clarity what we need. We need clarity about how we got to this point as a nation. Why are we in this stage as a nation? And I think of... Um, Gauguin has a famous painting uh, of Tahiti. And in French, he wrote, who are we, where are we from, and where are we going? And I think that's the moment as a nation we're in. And you know, when I think of the importance of understanding, um, it allows us to know what's at stake, how we got to this position, but also you can anchor a shared vision of the future only in a shared understanding of the past of the past that led to this moment. And, and I know that uh, in some of the research our colleagues did on identity-based polarization in the country, we find that you know Americans, as divided as we are, actually have a lot of areas of convergence and agreement. Um, and what often drives us further apart is what we think the other side thinks about us, how much they dislike us, how much we believe they dehumanize us how much they have profound disagreement. And while we do have profound positions and strong positions, we actually overestimate really how far apart we are as, as Americans from each other. And so to clarify that is also, I think, a way to think about how do we unify not only our nation, but unify what is at, what is at stake. Um, so, you know, I. I'm just really learning as much from what Liz and Gail and others have said, but also some of these other individuals and leaders I learned around the world. And I think we're in a process now, I know with a lot of people who have worked internationally as Americans to reach out and say, help us reflect on this moment we're in as a country. Because I think it was Gail who said that, um, what are the options? What are the choices? We have to address the profound challenges we face but we also have to find a way to understand each other um, because the other option is really what is not really um, one we want to face. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for discussion um, around the aspects of our country and discussion of unity and what that means and what that requires. Um, I wanted to now turn to Sabra. And Sabra, if you could talk a little bit about the work and how in the context of what you've been doing um, within prison populations in the arts, how has that brought to you a definition of healing and what that means? Thank you. First of all, I'm so grateful to be here in this amazing company. Um, I am coming to you from Tongva Shumash land, which we now call Los Angeles at the moment. And I say that because one way to start to heal as a country is changing who we center and um, bringing the truth to the table. And I heard 
the amazing Dr. Christopher talk about interconnectedness and defying preconceptions and that has definitely been my work the last 15 years and then I heard Liz Medicine Crow talking about healing means to be human together which has been a great experience for me to be in the presence of people I probably would not have been in the presence of inside prison and I heard Tim talk about clarity um, and the people I work with have given me nothing but clarity about the reality <clears throat> of America. So obviously I'm an immigrant, I'm an actor, an artist and an activist and I've been working in prison bringing in arts programs for 15 years. I can tell you in case you haven't been but prison is the most racist, punitive, repressed, violent place on the planet. It's basically everything we're dealing with on the outside, but on steroids. <laughs> um, and I think it makes it a very good place to look at healing from because I've seen it work in the most hopeless of situations. So um, when you go into prison, basically whatever life you are living in the community, however non-racist you might think you are, when you go to prison, you become racist because it's a matter of survival. Prison is predicated on race. So if you're a white person and you go to prison, you will have to work, be with the white supremacists um, to protect you from being hurt or killed. If you're Latino, you'll be with a Latino gang. Black, you'll probably be with the Crips or the Bloods. Um, and to test your loyalty, you will have to steal, deal and or hurt or enact violence on others so it doesn't happen to you. And so I guess for me, going into this boiling pot of violence as a, a little, you know, immigrant woman actor. <laughs> um, I was not thinking that there was going to really be much of a possibility of a lot of healing happening there. But I have seen when we create a space where the expectations are different and people are allowed to play like children, most of the people who get incarcerated have never had the opportunity to play because as children they were already dealing with so much trauma or a gang life um, and so they have very low expectations on them which they live up to and when you come with high expectations because humans do they meet those expectations so I guess in my work we create a space that enables a very different kind of culture um, where there's no right or wrong all races are represented and they get to play we work in four basic human emotions and you know if in in my uh, experience healing is an outcome right so you have to make the space a place where healing can happen mm -hmm. and then the people who are involved will let us know if it is healing to them so there's a lot to say about this work it's um it's pretty deep and it's also uh, very very necessary in order to be fully human whether you're incarcerated or you're not Thank you, Sabra, and thanks so much to all of you for capturing where you where you see and define healing within the scope of your experiences and the work you're doing, and really um, looking at how you see healing can happen. So what I'd like to do is to take the opportunity to pull from your experiences, your lived experiences, pull from your wisdom and the work that you've done, and learn more from you on specifically what experiences can you convey, can you talk about um, that you've had around healing? And with those experiences, what have you learned that you others who are, who are trying to get their heart and head and kind of arms around um, healing and, and divisions? And what challenges did you, did you deal with? And at the same time, what opportunities did, did you find? So is there anyone who would like to start off on that and then we can we can move on and get all of your wisdom collectively? I'll start. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. I do want to say that one of the most important lessons that I learned and it's from my profession as a holistic doctor, uh, healing is not a deficit frame. Um, in the Western cultures, uh, the more recent development over years of medical science, as we call it here in this country, you know, it's pathologically focused and it is a deficit model. 
Uh, but if we reach back to our ancestors and we, we acknowledge, you know, the splendor and the beauty and the amazing self-restoring, self-healing capacity that we're born with, you know, the human body literally creates itself, you know, from one cell. And so it certainly is healing and restoring itself. I don't think there's a, there's a tissue in our body that's more than 15 years old because we're always remaking, you know, and restoring ourselves. So it's very important to not go into this work from a, a deficit framework or a deficit understanding. Um, so I think that's one of the most important learnings that we try to embody in the work. And, and as, as Liz said so beautifully, what else is there? There is this continuous process of restoration. Uh, the other thing that I've learned, which is very important, is in terms of dealing with racism, right? There are many different forms of healing, but dealing explicitly with racism, uh, we need to model the desired state, you know? So in our particular approach to it, we always have co-facilitators, two people who are very different from each other on the surface, so that they are modeling this notion of connectedness throughout the work. We find that is very important. I will share a quick example of a woman who was in the circle, uh, one of our circles, and she happened to have immigrated to this country from South Africa. And she had carried with her, her entire life, a sense of shame that she was part of the oppressive group in South Africa. And that she, she, she really, you know, could not acknowledge that that was her root publicly because she of, of apartheid and the role her family had played in that. But in the course of a few hours of engagement, you know, in the healing circle with the focus on her humanity and the felt embrace of her peers and colleagues in that circle, she ended up being able to release that burden and being able, because she felt seen and heard as a human being, you know, and she was able to sort of separate her present self from the, 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 the overriding power of the lie of racial hierarchy. And, but she had spent her whole life doing that. She was a social worker, you know, and a movement therapist, but this was a moment of healing for her. So I guess the final lesson I would say is the importance of creating spaces that lead with love and allow the full humanity of those in the space to be the center of our focus. That's really beautiful, Gail. When you were talking about it, there was a sense of expansion and and shifting rather than what you had said to avoid the deficit, which I got a sense of closing in and limit. Yeah. Um, so very beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Who would like to share next some of the challenges and opportunities and, and lessons and conveying and, and story related to some of the work that you've been doing? I can go. This is lovely night. Thank you, Liz. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I just really want to build off of what Gail was sharing too, because in our experience in Alaska, one of the reasons that we really got into hosting Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity, which was the precursor to, um, for us, for Truth, Racial Healing Transformation, was that um, the race dialogue in Alaska was pretty non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, it was very um, swept under the rug. People didn't want to talk about it didn't want to acknowledge that it was um, a real issue within our communities and across the state. And so when something would happen within you know, our community, there would be this kind of response. And, um, and that's never been good for us as Native people. Uh, and, and we didn't want to continue to use a mechanism that wasn't good for our people. So we thought together and co-created a framework from around the state with other Native people that really was about operationalizing our shared values. You know, our, our elders say to us, and this is a common experience many of us have had um, growing up in Alaska um, in our very diverse Native cultures, but it was one that we share. Um, and that is, you know, when we're out of alignment with our community or within our families and some some hard truths need to be told to us. You know, our elders would say, we only talk to you like this because we love you. If we didn't love you, we wouldn't tell you the truth. We wouldn't waste our breath. 
And so we took that principle of how we approach talking about racism. And we co-designed a system to support having hard and uncomfortable con conversations. Now, you know, the connecting of hearts and minds is hard in a Western quote unquote civilization. Um, you know, people want to kind of put the mind on a pedestal. Um, but unfortunately, even if you want to do that, you cannot untether your heart. Um, and that's why we can have all the research in the world, but we don't change our behavior and we don't make different decisions based on it. You know, you have to have the connection to actually create a different focus of action and a different force to compel that action. Um, and so we took another piece of saying that a, a friend of ours from First Nations in Canada um, uh, shared with us, which is the closest distance between two people is a story. Now, that taps into that ancient part of our mind and our soul where when we can hear somebody else's story, we can hear their truth and be in a place of not having to judge their truth, but a place of being a recipient to the truth that they have lived. And that places us in a completely different kind of um, position with each other as people. So we take that and we create this framework so that we can have that on the personal level, on the interpersonal level, but then we also do that within institutions and also in terms of power structures and systems. So these things are scalable and you can actually put them to work, um, but you have to be able to create a scaffolding to do that. And that scaffolding is the ability to have hard conversations because you can't have healing without truth and you can't have truth and healing without the justice. They're, they're three things of the same thing. They're the same thing. So that's kind of how we created this process in Alaska and the way that we try to help people move along um, to actually get to the work. Thank you, Liz, and, re and really highlighting that it's multiple layers with the individual and interpersonal and then community, but then going out to institutions, that it's really a system that you're talking about and, I, and the hard conversations that put it all together. Th thank you very much for sharing that. And Tim, can you talk a little bit uh, more about um, some of the challenges and some of the things you've learned, especially in the research that you have done and you know, looked at some of these issues from a neuroscience, from an intergroup kind of dynamic um, group that could help really shine some light on some of the things that that weave through the challenges that we're facing and opportunities that you may have seen through your work. Thank you. And it's um, in listening to both Liz and Gail, I'm taking more notes and more things come up. So I'm going to try to keep it uh, concise. Um, you know, for 25 years, our approach was a very humble one of shared experience. As an American NGO, we set the table and brought in people uh, who never imagined changed, never imagined sitting across the table from somebody who may have killed their family, repressed their family, um, or been, you know, somebody they could never imagine sitting across from. And then started looking at brain and behavioral science about a decade ago. And one of the most powerful things as a non-scientist I learned was hearing from scientists that we have a biological necessity to feel understood as humans. That's just not empirical and intuitive. It is biological. And just knowing that is actually agency enabling. Because to a large extent, what I've seen and what I've experienced is that shame is there's something profoundly wrong about you. And when we feel shame, it's like, it's like you're falling into yourself and there's nothing to hang on to. And when somebody tells you and say what you're feeling, what you're experiencing is not unique to you, that other humans facing the similar challenges would respond the same way, literally we've seen reduces people's stress. They start to literally breathe more easily because there's a recognition that I am part of the human community, that I am not feeling this way because there's something particularly wrong about me, my family, or my community. And so knowing that is that to me and, and, and to the work we do, another powerful tool to help people transcend feelings of shame, of 
being victimized in a legitimate way, but feeling like nobody can understand what I'm going through. And the other thing um, is, I think it was Liz was saying about discomfort. A, one of my mentors from Guatemala told me, um, you know, we have to take people through zones of discomfort. It's hard to move people from A to Z, to recognize their privilege, to recognize sort of their, their mental model of the world. We're just not wired as a species to do that. And particularly when there's resistance within our own community to recognizing painful realities. So how do you take people who would say from A to D and give them a touchpad and then move from D to G and understanding not only the lived wisdom of how you transform and how people change, how do you create that bridge for people to change? And so when I think of, you know, forgiveness, you know, hearing a friend of mine who had survived incredible torture in Kenya said, you know, forgiveness is a personal choice, but to understand is an obligation. We need to understand for our own re rehabilitation why this is done to us. And also we need to understand why people may have acted the way they did. And so I think, you know, thinking about this conversation, I mean, these are some of the core, I think, dynamics that we have to really confront. And what I find powerful is not that science is giving us a new revelation, but it's an affirmation. And it gives strength to what wisdom that Liz has talked about in the Tingla to Haida community for, for millennia or other communities, right? That, that this is deeply rooted in the human experience. And one of the other quick things I'll say is that, you know, the enlightenment got a lot of this stuff wrong. <laughs> We're not these rational beings with emotions, right? As science is now more and more showing is we are these deeply emotionally based, unconsciously based beings who can really only think and engage rationally until we feel that our identities as we see ourselves are understood and valid, valued by others. And to have that science match to this wisdom and experience, I think creates a powerful tool. And I think it can help people recognize that they can step out of the, the crises they're in. And crisis is not even the word, the sense that nobody can understand their suffering. And so I just wanted to share that. Thanks, thanks so much, Tim, for tying a lot of the pieces together, grounded in the human um, nature, so to speak, and, and how we operate together as human beings. Thank you for that. And Sabra, so can you bring us home um, and <laughs> share um, your thoughts on some of the experiences or the stories that you've had with the challenges and the opportunities? And then we will have an opportunity to open it up for the Q&A. There, there are a lot of really interesting questions and people just waiting to, to share those questions with you. So Sabra. Yes, these things are never long enough. Like as soon as I hear all these things, I'm like, oh my gosh, we could talk for hours. It's so amazing. Um, I would just say, in my experience, a creative approach is, I don't want to say most effective, but highly effective in this space. Um, when people have caused harm, a kind of linear discussion feels confrontational to people and excruciating and can really repel many people. But as in many indigenous cultures, as this knows, um, artists can show the way because art allows resolution and healing as an outcome indirectly. And I always think about my friend, Sister Helen Prejean, who is a anti-death penalty, amazing nun. <laughs> she describes an approach as, she calls it sneaky Jesus, because she's a nun. So you think you're going down this path of like obstacles that can't be overcome or, and suddenly this unexpected door opens, or you think you're just going on with your life and suddenly an opportunity arises, what she calls sneaky Jesus. And I think like it also can be sneaky arts, you know, because really what we need is emotional tools to be able to deal with the process that we're going to go through as a country as we approach truth, racial healing and transformation. Um, because if we have those individual tools, we'll be able to manage ourselves as well as being able to work as a group together. And I'm just thinking a lot about this guy I met in prison. I've met all the best people in my life in prison. This um, guy I met called Danny, who I worked with in a maximum security prison here in California called Calipatria State Prison. 
and we do we do a week four hours a day every day intense theater music poetry training for a week every day they've never done anything like it before and then at the on the seventh day we turn it over to them and they run their own class so on the seventh day <laughs> sounds like biblical um i was just cleaning up getting ready to go and this guy danny who is a white supremacist admitted nazi with a swastika on his face came up to me and was like oh hey sabra can i ask you a question i'm a black jewish woman so you know and also you're not supposed to talk about personal stuff in prison so he came up to me and i was like oh god okay okay yes danny and he said um he said i just want to ask you how you feel about all the illegals coming into this country and I was like, oh, wow, this is either going to be a complete disaster or dangerous or something's going to happen. And so we just started this conversation between us because I felt we'd had a week of trust built up through doing this very intense work together where I just started by asking him, where do you get your news? It was the obvious places you might think of. But then as we started to talk, you know, and I asked him, what do you think it takes for somebody to walk across countries to come to this country? What do you think, you know, what do you think their life must have been like there? Why do you think they want to bring their children across a desert to come to California? And just like having a lot of questions and answers. And we talked for about maybe 15 minutes. And it was one of the most impactful conversations I've ever had in my life. And at the end of it, he looked at me and he said, you know what, Sabra, he said, I never thought I'd ever have a conversation like that with somebody who looks like you. And it was just such an emotional moment because we both moved. I wasn't the teacher and him the empty vessel. I had to overcome my preconceptions of this white guy with a swastika tattooed on his face. And he had to overcome his preconceptions of this black Jewish immigrant woman. And it wasn't, you know, it's not an easy conversation, but I think that we had built up because of the space and the culture we'd created between us we'd built a space where we were actually able to have a truthful conversation and I'll never forget him. Thank you, Danny, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you, Sabra, and your story brought together um, had mentioned of relation, how in the healing circles that she had developed transformation happens within relationship to the other and having difficult conversations as um, Liz has mentioned and Gail has mentioned and, and Tim and you. So thank you for bringing that together in a, in a real um, illustrative um, story that it ha had taken place. So we're going to now move on to Q&A and I'm going to, uh, my colleague Annalisa Jackson and I will popcorn since um, we've been using the term popcorn with the last exercise, we'll use it here too. We're going to popcorn back and forth on the questions. And I think what we'll do is we'll ask the question to a specific person or the question was asked, or we will do that um, with where, we, where it seems to fit. And then anyone else afterwards, just feel free to um, weigh in and let us know. And we'll, anyone who wants to contribute, um, we will do that to each question. So Annalisa. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. So our first um, question that we'll look at um, is, um, and I'll, I'll read the comment that came in. It seems uh, that comments so far have assumed getting people together, but a vast number of people are sequestered into their own bubble, getting information and support from those who only agree with them. So how do we get past this massive barrier to engagement? And Gail, would you lead us off with that question, given all the depth of experiences you had related to that topic? Thank you for the question. It's really the right one. Uh, we always say that the real work of creating the healing circles happens before the circle in terms of the invitation. Uh, and we start with, well, what is the purpose of the circle? You know, what is it that we are trying to do in our community? It could be getting people to vote for increasing school funding, or it could be getting rid of uh, liquor stores in our community, or it could be something as basic as um, making sure that our, our places to vote are not moved, you know. But you have a purpose, but you know you need a critical mass, you need to keep expanding your circles of engagement around this purpose 
So you know you want to bring 24 people into the into the conversation and you want them to be diverse. You want them to represent, you know, to be representative in, in a diverse way. So you you have credible people reach out to the people that you would like to have present, you know. So if you would like um, people who adhere to the white nationalist philosophy to be in the room, then you have someone who adheres to that philosophy, invite them. That's an extreme example. But uh, you always want to your committee or your group that's setting up the circle to make sure that you have credible people invite folks to be engaged. And that is the work, making sure on the front end that you've invited people into the space. Now, of course, these spaces are virtual. So, you know, we can bring very, very diverse people together for a virtual experience uh, like this. So that would be my answer to the question. And, and oftentimes people will say, well, I don't know any indigenous people. I don't know any tribal members or Native Americans. I don't know any undocumented immigrants, et cetera. And so that's when you know you have to do the work and you have to work harder. But this is part of the work is upfront to get the people into the room, to be intentional about that. And you ask yourself, who's not? in the room, you know, you really push ourselves to, to reach out. Wonderful, Gail. So other, other panelists, anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I would like to, um, to share something that we encountered as well, which is this notion of preaching to the choir. Um, I'm sure we've all heard people say that. And when we were forming and creating our process and, and starting to go through it, uh, we had a, um, a visionary committee of people made up of all kinds of backgrounds, native, non-native, um, other folks of color, um, white folks, folks who live in Alaska and call it home. And um, one of the things that came up was this notion of, you know, but are we only preaching to the choir? And, um, you know, one of the things we decided to do was, you know, really just be honest with ourselves. And the fact of the matter is that the choir hasn't been coming to practice. The choir thinks they get a free pass and that they don't actually have to do the hard work. And so um, a lot of people think that, oh, I'm on the right side of this issue, but they're not actually doing anything, right? It's kind of like the difference between being a non-racist and being an anti-racist. And so um, we realize that we have a lot of people who think that they're not the problem, that other people are. And so it excuses them from really doing the hard work of critically examining where they're at, where their family's at, where their work's at, where all the systems that they influence are at. And so um, instead of focusing on the extremes, we focus on the choir and building out the choir. And Gail said it earlier in her opening remarks that it's the building out the center of who we are strengthens the entire effort. And also it starts like a pebble in the pond, it ripples out and we start in enlarging the choir in that sense. And I think that that's an important piece um, of thinking about these things from a strategic lens. Uh, so I wanted to share that. Thank you, Liz. Tim, you had some remarks related to this question. Yeah, I mean, two things. I want to go back to <clears throat> what I learned as a non-scientist from, from science, which I found very helpful and, and I found others found helpful. And that is um, really starting between four and eight years of age, all humans develop these sort of mental models of the world, as scientists call them. They develop sort of an internal GPS system that helps them guide themselves through the world. And that's where some very negative ways of thinking come online. Um, and also for some, what is for them uh, in the world. And as that mental model of the world takes shape and guides us as we get older, um, you know, learning that and recognizing that all of us have that built-in sort of system in our brain, for me, has given me not that these people get a pass, but how do you help people change? How do you help people sort of shift their mental model of the world, how they see themselves in the world? And to give that as an example, there's a man named Rolf Meyer, who was the chief negotiator for the National Party and the talk stand apartheid. And he said he grew up as an Africana thinking apartheid was not only good for whites, but for, Af for blacks. And you would think, how in the world could he ever think that? And he came to realize 
as he was exposed to the world around him in South Africa, actually visited townships when he was in government, he started seeing a reality that on the, shocked him and made him really challenge without calling it out, his own paradigm, his own mental model of the world, that construct in his mind that his community built of who has power, who doesn't, why are people this way and why are we this way? And what was so powerful is recognizing the need for change was in a sense of him shifting his own mental model of the world and recognizing how do I shift the mental model of other people in my community and tribe. Um, and I think, you know, it just is a really an interesting construct that all humans have a built in mental model of the world, either one that strikes them as or not strikes them, it, it derives them of agency. Or in others think, well, this is for me. And I think recognizing that it's almost like, how do we shift the mental model of a lot of Americans right now? <laughs> how do we shift the way they see themselves, why they think they deserve this? or and others don't. And I think the more we can unpack that, I think the more it gives us tools to, to address some of these challenges. Great, Th thanks so much, Tim. So Annalisa, can you um, lead us off with the next question? Yes, we had another uh, question on what conditions uh, would be helpful or must exist in order to have government officials leading with heart? Uh, within bureaucratic systems and institutions. Okay, thanks, Annalisa. Gail, could you start us off again? Because um, I know you've worked on the policy end and trying to bring in government. Can can you lead us off with that question? That's a tough one. Uh, the operative word, I think, in the question is condition. And condition means environment. In my mind, I translate that into environment. Uh, an environment is shaped by vision and expectation. And so we have now um, leadership, which has a lot to do with the vision and the expectation. So uh, I think that that's an important prerequisite is that there be the expectation or there be a vision that drives certain behaviors and certain actions. And we wanna, we wanna seize this moment as best we can. Uh, the other thing that I have found, uh, I ran the Institute for Government Innovation at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and, and we wanted to lift up the brave and courageous souls within the public sector who were doing very innovative, cutting edge things, and we wanted to acknowledge and reward them. Uh, I love Howard Gardner's work uh, around the art and science of changing hearts and minds. And, and he reminds us that it takes multiple interventions simultaneously, one of which is reason. And so we did things like a business case for racial equity, which helps people in a leadership position to present a rational case for the work, which then helps them to have the cover, you know, for the necessary work. So that's another condition is to provide the information, the reason, right? Uh, and then we can go through research and resonance. The resonance piece is where we get into the, the heart and the emotion. So I believe we need to have people in public sector institutions, government employees, civil servants and elected officials going through these healing experiences so that they too are moving from a heart space. They too are understanding from an emotional place the, the connection, if you will, the power. And I've seen people have that internal transformation and then do their work from that place of knowing, from that place of understanding. And so that's a, that's a, you know, a complicated answer to a basic question, but vision, expectation, information, the necessary strategic cover so that a, a public sector person will not be vulnerable because they're taking a stand. And in a capitalist society, it's often a business case that provides that cover, but also building the, the circles of compassion and empathy and giving those leaders the tools that they need. Thank you, Gail, that's beautiful. Um, and I, when you talked about that, it made me think um, with, with Sabra, the work that you're doing, you are working directly in a government system, the prison system, which is not an easy, 
um, system in which to, to, to try to access. Could you talk a little bit about how that has worked and how you've connected with, with the government aspect and, and blending together some of this work that you've been doing? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question, whoever asked it. Um, thank you, Gail. I agree with everything you said. Um, there's a few things. So, yes, I work in like the craziest hierarchy you can imagine with the most bureaucracy you can imagine. Um, and also I work with a lot of politicians. And so one of the things that I've noticed since having the good fortune to work with the Obama DOJ and with the White House back in those days is that they would always say, what do you want? And I would say, we want you to bring artists to the table. And they'd be like, yes, great. So when we're talking about the arts, we will bring artists to the table. I'm like, no, you have to have artists at the table when you're discussing legislation, when you're making budget, when you're talking about justice reform, because artists think differently and we can change culture. And so one of the things that um, I really wanted to do from when I started to work in prison was work with correctional officers. And um, because correctional officers have a almost identical culture in a lot of ways to people who are in gangs, who are inside prison. And so I kind of realized that there's several prongs, you know, prison is like the micro of the macro of the country. You know, there's several prongs to making real deep cultural change. One is the people most directly impacted. One is the people who are in charge of them or overseeing them. And the other one is the people making the legislation that put them there. And so really wanted to work with correctional officers and knew that, you know, we didn't have any integrity with correctional officers as far as being artists. You know, they think we're what they call hug a thug, you know, woolly liberals who love people who are incarcerated. So I decided to go through their union. So I made some friends in the union did some work with the correctional officers union and had like you were saying the correctional officers union say hey guys you need to do this as part of our new healing thing so we started working with correctional officers and it was mind-blowing it was mind-blowing to see them come to a an arts workshop in full uniform you know super reluctantly they had to be forced to go and then by the end of a weekend, completely transforming themselves through the work and being able to talk to other people who are in their situation and to change their narrative about what we do and what healing is. And then we're doing the same with government officials. You know, we were asked in the LA, in the city of LA, to come and to lead um, a meeting for uh, the, the um, mayor's office of reentry because everything is very bureaucratic and they felt like people are not receiving the information they wanted them to receive. So what we know is how to use the arts as a tool to receive, really fully receive information. And we did the exercise we're going to do today with a whole bunch of super bureaucratic people. And at the end of it, this one very old guy, old like guy in his suit, old white guy. And he said, he said, I just want to say that I'm a bureaucrat, I'm a paper pusher. I've been working in the city for 50 years. I've never written a poem. I've never done anything creative in my life. And he started crying. He was like, I've written a poem. And I feel like not only can I really understand what we've been talking about today, but I feel like I've changed my narrative on who I am and what is for me and how I look at the world by writing one poem this guy changed about look how he looked at himself and the world so that's the power of the arts and that's why it's so important that it's not just the people most impacted who are doing the work but the people who are creating the the situation and the systems that put them there thanks so much sabra so um liz you had comments um related to this and how working with government and then um we have, I think, two or more, two more questions, and then we will move to the um, exercise in closing. So, Liz. Yeah, finish uh, Yeah, I love that, Sabra. Uh, one of my my dear sisters, she's a Maori woman in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. She says, "Art is the first revolution." And so we have to, we have to acknowledge that uh, there is a incredibly important part of a human's human spirit who um, only responds to and can be cracked open by art. 
Um, and, 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 and that's a place that uh, I think people need to understand the power of that artistic tool um, in deploying it in a place of, of getting through this, um, this, this, the sickness, this illness of racism that our society is so um, uh, under and burdened by. Um, I wanted to share another approach for government in terms of some work that's happened in Alaska. Um, you know, the state of Alaska has sued its native people more than any other state in the country. And um, when it comes to our native children, um, within the Office of Children's Services, OCS and Alaska's Department of Health and Social Services, um, for decades, 60% of the children placed in out of home placements are Alaska Native children, 60%. Our population is 20% of the state. And um, while people talked a lot and people tried to do a lot about it, um, it was incredibly um, disproportionate, whoever was in office. Um, and so when we were doing some work in this area with uh, Valerie Davidson, who was the first Alaska Native woman who was the commissioner of the Department of Health and Social Services. She also serves as a trustee on our First Alaskans Institute board. Um, she brought us in to help host some dialogues between the litigators um, and the heads of our tribal organizations and our native um, attorneys, as well as the state OCS and the state's attorneys, people who had been suing each other for decades. And we came in and we just had some heart to heart conversations. Um, they had not had that opportunity before to sit together and listen to each other and to align a purpose and a vision of, you know, really taking care of the children and um, working with in essentially a decolonial framework um, to understand that our Native children are safe with their families and in their communities and their cultures. And that's why the Indian Child Welfare Act had been created in the 1970s to protect our children from being stolen from us, another governmentally sanctioned um, way of assimilating and colonizing us uh, was to take our children this way. And so ICWA was passed. Well, it's not and hasn't been implemented fully and, and, and in the spirit of it in Alaska. And there's just been a whole bunch of harm between our native organizations and the state. So this was a new approach to bring people together, to sit in a circle, to really listen to each other um, and to stick to it. And when you hear Val talk about this experience, um, you know, to, to hear that it was about moving people's hearts and minds. That's the only way we could get things to shift. And then what happened as an outcome of that, it took, it took the entire length of the administration, but it moved from a place of litigating against each other to actually starting to work together, to then moving through a strategic planning process together, and then creating the first ever of its kind in the country, a tribal children's well-being compact, so that the state of Alaska was compacting with the tribes in Alaska for them to actually take on um, more of the work of Office of Children's Services as defined by and determined by those tribes rather than being forced into this construct that has always failed us. Um, and so it started with those kinds of dialogues though. It started with having that kind of space. Thanks, thanks so much, Liz. Um, what we're gonna now is going to do a double hit two for one where we're going to have and um, ask the question in the order to make sure that everybody is able to express their wisdom um, in the order that we started. So we'll go in the order that we started in as we will finish and come full circle. So if Gail can lead us off um, and then Liz and then Tim and then Sabra uh, for the next two questions. So, Annalisa, it's over to you. Great. So, um, the first question that um, I'll ask is actually condensed from a few of the questions that came in um, regarding how we can start difficult conversations on controversial political topics, especially with people that we love, people who are close to us. How do we have and sustain these conversations in a calm way that's focused on healing and restoring relationships? 
And then the second question um, is, how do each of you take care of yourselves during this really difficult and heavy work? Uh, what sources of resilience do you call upon and, uh, and what has called you into this work in the first place? I will hand it over to Gail. Hi, thank you, Annalisa. I, I want to be clear that what we might have once described as political conversations are really no longer political conversations. Uh, they, in many cases, they have become wrapped up in deep emotion and, and pathology, in some cases almost cult-like, particularly in our families. And so the kinds of advice we might have given, say, 10, 15 years ago about political conversations, that advice is less applicable now, you know. Uh, and so the people who, who understand the extreme emotional investment that people have today in terms of what we used to call politics, they recognize that you really don't start with a political conversation. You, you, you go to the place where there is common understanding and you, you begin to build trust around things that you do have in common, or you find a shared experience that you have enjoyed together, you find humor. You know, the first thing you have to do is almost like build a, a road, a path to connection that creates a safe space, if you will, a compassionate space for shared understanding. So I just wanna, you know, for the listeners, you know, right now things are so polarized that trying to confront a family member or engage around extremely very different perspectives is not easy. And it begins with building some connective tissue, I believe, between the two people that, that gives permission for, for deeper discussions. So that's my answer to the first question. The second question in terms of how, what do I do? Uh, uh, I, I have a dog and um, my dog uh, is a wonderful, gentle, sweet companion soul. And so she, uh, she keeps me balanced and centered in, in very special ways. And about once a day, I realize how blessed I am to have the gift of her companionship. And I'm outside with her four times a day. And in those moments, I, I relish in the beauty of nature and in the sweetness of the forest that surrounds my home. And, and, and that keeps me centered and the last thing I will say is I'm a, a relatively new grandmother and I have a friend who says that we have a special gene that turns on when we become a grandparent and it just unleashes all this joy and hope and, and this sense of possibility as well as determination to make the future a better place for them. Thank you, Gail. Um, Liz. Uh, I think that there's so many different approaches that we can take. <clears throat> one, um, one thing that I would say though is uh, some of the advice that we receive from our, um, our co-creators um, and our people as we do this work um, is to remember that sometimes um, it's, it's about safety and, and about you as the person who wants to have the conversation, um, knowing how to create that safe space for yourself um, and, and what you're ready to do. And, and an honest reflection of, you know, how ready are you to have these conversations, especially because in our home lives and our family lives, these can be really painful and, and hard conversations. So a couple of the things that, you know, for folks who have been going down this path and wanting to have these kind of conversations and using like our method of hosting dialogues. Um, one of the things that we say is, you know, who else in your family may feel the same way that you do? And can you have a conversation with them so that it's like, it's kind of like have that space of trust first with yourselves and others and just start building it and building the conversation and seeing where people are at. Um, another thing that comes from our family's practice and then um, some of the wisdom of our peoples, our native peoples, is kind of a circle peacemaking approach. Um, and, you know, when somebody in our community or our family, for instance, does something out of alignment, when we have to have, as our elders say, you know, 
that moment of we only talk to you like this because we love you um, is it becomes a family conversation and um, when when it happens in our family you know uh, the person who's causing kind of this the space of unbalance or hurt um, or angst or has done some act that is really painful for the family or that the family needs to hold them accountable for some act they did in the community um, and these are based off of our ancient clan structures, um, then we would say, you know, have everyone come to, together um, to break bread and um, starting with the eldest all the way down to the youngest to talk about um, how this is impacting them and how they feel about it. Um, that's another approach and that's built off of those circle peacemaking techniques. The other thing that I would say is sometimes you can't be a prophet to your own people. So this is also another mechanism that we use. And um, sometimes they can hear it from others better than they'll ever hear it from you. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's something that has helped us and guided us in a number of very tight spaces and, and hard dialogues. We have to remember that sometimes it's not our voice they need to hear. Thank you so much. Uh, next we'll hear from Sabra. I think it's Tim first. Okay. Over to you, Tim, and then back to you, Sarah. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say that even when there's profound division, um, people have much more in common than they ever imagined. And I think that's something I've seen um, in many countries around the world where I, I think of Northern Ireland where we did a lot of work where you would see Catholic and Protestant leaders at different levels, that when they literally came in contact with people, there was great fear and anxiety. They would often look over their shoulder to see if somebody from their political party was anywhere near the space where they may be <laughs> with somebody across the other side. And just that engagement, that contact started to humanize the other. And then they started finding, actually, we have more in common. And sometimes what they have in common is what they fear. Um, that they feel like they're not treated with dignity, that they're not being heard, um, that they're being manipulated, that they've been excluded. And those are unfortunately very universal experiences. And, you know, it, part of the problem is those who are most in tension have very little real understanding and contact with each other. And so all of these misperceptions, not just based on lack of contact, but also these bubbles we live in particularly now in this country, we live in different media bubbles, we live in different geographic bubbles. And one of the things I mentioned in the research our colleagues did on America's divided mind is that Republicans and Democrats, as Gail said, it's no longer just polarization through traditional profound disagreement, it's about identity. And when it becomes about identity, a whole range of unconscious psychological processes come online that start to drive us further apart. And that, sort of drives more of this toxic polar identity-based polarization we see in our country. But the reality is, is that a lot of that's being shaped by false beliefs about the other side. And so over the last six months, as we'd give presentations to groups and members of Congress or media, there was a hunger across both sides to know that it isn't as bad as they're led to believe or think they believe in their bubbles. And whether it's in a family, whether it's in a state or a community, it's to recognize that we actually have more in common than we imagine. And how do you get that out? How do you reinforce that in this sort of really, at times, destructive cognitive ecosystem we live in is really the challenge. But, but we do have much more in common. Okay, I'm going to be quick because I know we don't have much time. Um, so in terms of difficult conversations, I would just say there's a few things. The first thing I always start with is I always make agreements so that everybody's voice is heard, what they need in order to create a space to have a difficult conversation. The second thing I would say is listen, uh, ask questions and then do not put your own point of view on it. Listen to hear rather than to respond. Um, we have to make a space that is like a space where we can fail and we can, you know, not say things in a, you know, kind way sometimes, you know, it's not always about trying to protect other people's feelings. 
my point of view is that what we have to do is help people build tools to deal with their own feelings because we, we are not supposed to be the person who asks the question and also judges how it's going to be received. I remember one of the things I really wanted to do for a long time was to have um, I didn't get around to it because I'm also a working actor, but you know, to have like the police, LAPD, come to a space where they come in and the first thing they have to do is an implicit bias test and then they're not allowed to say anything at all about it. They're not allowed to discuss it. They have to just sit with what, what their outcomes were of that implicit bias test. And then the next thing they have to do is they have to just listen to the stories of people who have been harmed by the actions of LAPD. That's all they're allowed to do for the whole day. And then after that, they can sit and they can have a discussion together. Um, I haven't done that yet, but I'm gonna do that one day because that's gonna be very interesting. <laughs> um, and then the other question, the self-care question is, for me, I didn't realize, you know, people were constantly asking me, why don't you get secondary trauma? You're working with some of the most traumatized people you could meet. And I realize it's because I'm not going into prison as a professor, I'm going in as a partner. And so I am playing too, I'm doing the work as well. And so for me as an artist, I process the world and I guess I process hurt and trauma through my art, through playing. And now that, you know, there hasn't been any prison or any acting for a year, I'm realizing I now feel much more trauma than I have ever felt working in prison because I have nothing to process it with. I don't have the work that I usually have to process it with. So um, I think that's what I, the only way I can do self-care now is uh, baking, <laughs> is gardening and is painting and I'm writing a book. So I'm not sure if that's self-care or more torture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sovereign. Thank you, everyone. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just shift a little bit the schedule, given the timing. And so what we would like to do next is to go over to Auntie next so he could provide the closing remarks. And then we will move um, for, over to Sabra so she can lead us in her amazing um, her amazing popcorn waterfall exercise that runs about 10 minutes so that everybody could decide um, after that you stay on. Pardon? It's shorter? I'll try and make it a bit shorter. Okay, so perfect. So that way, if anyone has to leave at 530, feel free. And then we're going to continue on and we can um, do the fun exercise, the creative exercise with Sabra. And then Auntie will be mentioning after the session with Sabra, um, a, a brainstorming input session that if anyone's interested in, there will be a link in the chat, but Auntie will mention it. But if you need to leave, we have a hard um, end at 530 after Auntie's closing remarks. Um, thank you. And um, please, um, if you'd like to stay on for the creative exercise with Sabra, we welcome you. It will be fun. And then um, for the session that Auntie's going to mention on brainstorming. So Auntie. Thank you, Colette. And I assume you, many of you have felt the same, which is the feeling when you are in the presence of wisdom, that you want to stay there. And uh, it's almost like a homecoming. And what echoes it with me, I think should echo in this nation, every chamber, every heart is the invitation to return to the human family. And for us, a human fam family to return into the coexistence with the nature, the water, as you said, the air, the animals. I think that in invitation is extremely powerful. And the fact that we are in this moment, knowing that this knowledge exists and we're sharing that invitation at this critical moment, is just so heartwarming. I will just end by saying that um, we intend uh, uh, to start a series, which means that we hope to give space, limelight, and amplify the great work that is being done throughout this nation so that hope is being restored uh, on this work based on what is being done today uh, on the real work, on the real actors, uh, as we have heard today. And also, I want to announce that uh, Colette is also uh, uh, releasing a podcast series uh, today done with Cam, uh, our colleague. And the first guest will be Melanie Greenberg from Humanity in the Island this week. And then next week, Gail Christopher, and there'll be 
um, several guests coming uh, every, on a weekly basis to that podcast. Uh, Colette, you want to put that on, on or Hannah on the link. And uh, just regarding the follow-up conversations where you are welcome to come and share your ideas and, and promise your partnerships. And I will also put that link to the new Zoom call afterwards. But I really look forward, Sabra, to your exercise. So I hope everybody can stay. But thank you again, everybody, for creating this presence of wisdom. Thank you, Auntie. Thank you, everybody. Um, so can we just start by taking, I think we need after this amazing discussion, let's take one unified breath. Sometimes we forget to breathe. <laughs> Quite often we forget to breathe, kind of important. Um, so we're gonna just write a bit of poetry. What is poetry? I usually would have people talking to me about what that is, but I don't have that today. So I'll tell you, poetry is really just an expression of what you're feeling. This is not school. It doesn't have to be shared. It never has to be shared. You can share if you like, but you never have to. It's a, a way to just express what's happening inside of you and to put it down on paper, a different medium. And sometimes that helps us to receive the information and the experience that we've gone through together. So this is a, a bastardized version of a great exercise from Inner City Arts called Popcorn Waterfall. So I'm gonna ask each of you, if you may, or I will invite you to write in the chat a couple of words or a short phrase that didn't come out of your own mouth that you heard today that impressed you in some way or stuck on you in some way so if you can just enter in the chat a word or a short phrase that you heard today that would be great this is the popcorn part go ahead and put it in there hopefully there'll be quite a few there we go my friend sneaky jesus <laughs> okay, what else did you hear? Yes. Oh my gosh, this is great. Okay, so as they're coming, I'm just going to give you a couple more seconds in case anybody wants to write anything. Hmm. Yeah, fantastic. You guys, amazing. I'm not supposed to say you guys. Now I'm teaching at university, I'm told not to say you guys, I have to say y'all, which sounds very weird in an English accent. <laughs> okay, great. So now that's great. We have quite a few in here. Um, you're welcome to add more if you want. I'm going to read them out or you and or you can look in the chat and just write a couple of them down on a piece of paper that I hope you have in front of you. So I'll read them and also you can just look in the chat and write a couple down that you didn't write. The closest distance between two people is the story. Sometimes you can't be a prophet to your own people. Sneaky Jesus. Hear truth without judging. Returning to our wholeness. Closest distance between two people is a story. We don't need unity, we need clarity. Sneaky Jesus, so popular. S closest distance between two people is a story. Three times, oh my gosh. Gail, you're very, very popular. <laughs> Enlarge the center, truth, justice, healing, having the hard conversation, being in relation with each other. Healing means to be human together. Listen to hear, not to respond, build the choir. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Okay, so have a look through here and just write one or maybe two of these down on your paper please. Thank you. So now what we're going to do next is we're going to write a poem. And what you're, I'm going to ask you to do is to include what you wrote down, those words, in your poem. You can use other words as well. Here's the important thing. Don't edit. This is not about being good. This is just about keeping your pen moving on the paper and including whatever it was that you wrote down from that list. Don't sweat it. You don't ever have to share. I'm going to give you a minute and a half to do it and just keep that pen going on the paper and don't judge yourself. Ready? Go.
30 seconds. Okay, and this is the good bit, finish or don't finish. I always prefer don't finish. I love poems that finish halfway through a line. I'm so good with failure, love it. Trained myself to fail big in public. <laughs> there you go, good. So now let's just take one more unified breath. And a second of gratitude for us being here together, alive, hopefully healthy full of ideas for the future and if anybody I know we have like no time but if there's anybody who would like to share you could put it in the chat um, or anybody who's here on this panel could read theirs out if they want to um, would be a good example of not worrying about what people think about our terrible poetry you know what I'll start I'll start and I'll let myself jump off the cliff how about that Returning to the greater whole, our wholeness, the human condition, we have forgotten our brothers, sisters, animal, water, sunshine. No matter how fast we run, we'll never outrun our humanity. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, here's one. Hang on. Oh, great. I can be human alone. Look at the world behind a thin glass that seems to let the breeze through. Or maybe I imagine it. Or I can be human together with you sit in the center and get bigger, then have you sit in the center and we both get bigger, and the glass, of course, when we get big, we end up breaking it, it shatters with a tiny wine. Wow, yeah. And Colette, you're gonna have to stop me because otherwise I'm gonna read all of these. Can I read one more? Of course. Okay. Forgiveness is a personal choice. Oh, where did it go? Understanding is obligatory. Healing means to be human together, returning to our wholeness. Discomfort, sitting, being with it, stay with it, stay. In relation, emotion, a lot, discomfort. Way forward to healing and being human together. I don't know what to do, but they say it's a story. They say it's listening to hear, not response. Maybe I can be a, can't be a prophet to my own people, but it's the story. Maybe I know what to do. What we're trying to do may take a thousand years, not 999, not a thousand and one, because for all quests such as ours, quests to fight deficits, to rediscover healing, there are sometimes small windows. It is our job to make these windows feel bigger, to finish our hard, holy work. Stop, keep going. I think let's go for one more and then we'll just be five minutes over, which is legitimate. <laughs> we can do <laughs> two more. Short one. Enlarge my center, or shall it be our center? Together, family. That's one. And then the last one. Healing means to be human together, but we are so far apart. Gravity, or the law of it, pulls bodies of mass to each other. What is the tool to bring them together? If the closest distance between two people is a story, are the stories gravity? You guys. And then there's, there's one more, Sabra. Yeah. One more, Sabra. Oh, there's one more? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Connected by story, centered in clarity, seeking to be understood. Just, you see, I feel like then we, we got We got another one. We're we got more. Keep going. We connect with our emotions, right? And that is how movement happens. Clarity, clarity, truth is where it's at. Unity, unity first. We need that truth. And then Diane says it's the best tea break she's had in quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Cool. Thank you so much for indulging me and for transform. I always say turn it into art. So we just turned this conversation into art today. Thank you. It was so beautiful. Thank you 
so much, Sabra, and thanks so much to everyone on the panel for sharing your time and your energy and your experience and your heart. And it's just been such a pleasure, pleasure um, spending this time with you. And thanks so much to everybody who joined this, all of the wonderful people um, who, who participated in this and asked questions and who, who was present and all of the amazing, amazing um, um, poems. It's, it's just been so much, so much joy to be, to be here. So um, if at this point, Auntie, if you're there, um, I'd like to turn it over, for, over to you for the last comments and to bridge into what's gonna happen in the next session for anybody who wants to stay on, we'll exit this and we'll, we can go on to another Zoom for those who wanna continue with the discussion on the way forward for future events. Yeah, correct. So Hannah has posted the Zoom link and anyone who has some ideas or otherwise would want to contribute in the future of this webinar series do join us and we look forward to hearing from you, your recommendations. And I would just love to have the poems and going. So uh, yeah, but thank you also from my end for everybody. I hope you'll copy the poems before you end the Zoom. Yeah. We'll save the chat. And like Andy said, let's just stay here. Anyone who wants to, we're not, let's not turn it off. Let's just sit and people who need to leave, well, you're welcome, honoring your time. But let's just sit in the poems that are there. Let's just, if you're, if you're, if you're up for it, Sabra, let's just see where the poems come. Of course, always up for poetry. <laughs> Wait, is there more? Did I miss any? No, I don't think I missed any. If you have one and you haven't put it in the chat and you would like to share, you are welcome to. You never have to. Wonderful. I think we can officially close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. And go well into the, the evenings or mornings or, or afternoons, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.